Well, can I get a howdy? howdy. Can I get a whoop? whoop? All right. Some of you just betrayed your alma mater, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm so glad to be here with you guys today. Um, it's really a privilege to worship and just to really just to be able to open God's word with you today. And we're going to be looking at a difficult passage and explore what it means to be a a disciple of Jesus. And so I want to start off with a famous quote by Diedrich Bonhoeffer that you've probably heard before that says, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It doesn't sound like fun. And this passage doesn't sound like much fun either. Luke 14, disclaimer, it's a difficult passage and it's a little bit like having cold water splash on your face. So get ready. Verse 25, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone does not, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is God's holy word. But I'm not feeling good after reading that. How about you? For most of us, we feel one of two things when we read these difficult words of Jesus. We like this stuff about like love your neighbor as yourself and, uh, you know, blessed are the merciful for they'll receive mercy. But when Jesus comes out of the gate and starts out like this, we have one of two responses. One is that we are a little uncomfortable. And on the other, we can be a little dismissive. And I just want to caution all of us today as we study this not to be dismissive because it's a dangerous temptation to just kind of dull the edges off and make the words of Jesus more palatable. So let's not do that. Instead, let's engage in the uncomfortable space that is this this text. And I think that it's uncomfortable because Jesus actually intended for us to be uncomfortable. I think that it was uncomfortable for the hearers that heard it. And as we engage in this uncomfortable space, I think it's also important to note that many of us feel uncomfortable when we hear words like this because we view Jesus in our own context, in our own world and life. And so I heard a famous theologian use this illustration. I'm going to submit it for us to consider this morning. Some of us view Jesus as if he's a political candidate that we're voting for. We're in an election season. It's about to come up. Does the election season ever really end? Six to ten billion dollars, Forbes magazine says, will be spent in the 2020 election cycle alone. All to get you, all motivated to get you to vote for someone. So let's say you picked your candidate and you go to uh, a rally or go to hear them speak. And they say, vote for me. And you say, okay, I'm going to vote for you. I really want to vote for you. And everyone's clapping. And then he says, or she says, if you vote for me, it's likely going to be very difficult for you. In fact, it's going to be so hard that you might even lose your life. So vote for me. (laughs) We would laugh just like you did. We'd say, you're crazy. You're crazy. I'm not, I'm not voting for you. You're supposed to make my life better. In theory, that's the role of a, of a civil servant. In theory, is that you're supposed to make my life better. And if that's not going to happen, I'm just not going to vote for you. 
But many of us do view Jesus like this. He's a political candidate that we vote for, and we do that because we want to have a better life. We want to have the good life. We want to have our prayers answered, and we want to have some things worked out, maybe by God, that will improve. But what happens when Jesus is the political candidate that you vote for and things don't turn out? the way that you expected. The prayers aren't answered or they're not answered in the way that you hoped for. Or your life is about the same as it was when you first voted for him. If that's the case, then you leave disillusioned and check out like a lot of Americans are right now because Jesus is just a candidate that they've voted for. This same theologian and professor said, Jesus is actually nothing like a a candidate that we're voting for. He's much more like a skilled mountain guide that's taking us through treacherous terrains. And he can see down the mountainside and he can see storms coming. And he knows that he knows where the dangers are, where the pitfalls are. He knows where the dead ends are. And he's leading us on this path because he cares for us. And he turns to, to the crowd and says, If you follow me, things are likely to become very, very difficult. They're going to be very hard. You're going to face hardship. You're going to face difficulty. And you may, in fact, need to lose a lot of your gear because we need to travel light and fast. And some of you may even lose your own life. You need to follow me. If we're in that same scenario right there, those words have a very different meaning than the political candidate that we vote for because we know that this skilled mountain guide has our best interests in heart. He may call me to do things that are difficult and dangerous, but he's saying these things so that I can have life to the full. So as we work through the text, this uncomfortable passage, let's think of Jesus as the skilled mountain guide that has our best interests at heart and not a political candidate that we're voting for. Let's jump to verse 25 right there at the beginning. Jesus says, now great, or the, Luke says, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them. So there's crowds that are following, and they've been following Jesus. If you turn left to uh, Luke 13, verse 22, it says that Jesus was on his way through towns and villages and teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. So these crowds are following. Actually, this whole section from Chapter 9 to chapter 19, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he knows what's ahead. He knows that he's going to die. He knows he's going to be raised to new life. He knows what's ahead. And he's stopping in these towns and he's teaching. He's healing people and crowds start to follow. And Those are the crowds that are with him. Now, Jesus knows something very particular here that we may not see. These crowds are following and journeying with him. This same crowd in Luke chapter 19 is going to be extremely excited when he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then later in a few verses after that, when Jesus walks into the temple and flips tables and stops people from giving sacrifices and they're confused about Jesus, that probably the same crowd is around. And he also knows that this same crowd is probably going to be around in chapter 23, yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Just could be that Jesus knows what's ahead and he's starting to sift the crowd from the disciples because he knows that just to be in the crowd doesn't mean you're a disciple He's sifting and he's using this language on purpose. And he's trying to find the true disciples. Now this word disciple, it's not a word that we use a lot today outside of the church. Very rarely I'll hear Stephen A. on ESPN say something about someone being a a disciple of LeBron James. I would like to consider myself a disciple of of James Harden. Um, But I digress. And so Jesus is using a word that was used a lot in this day and age. It's the word mathetes. Can you say mathetes? Mathetes means pupil or learner or apprentice. And that's actually what Jesus is going after. He knows that there are some people that are true apprentices, people, students, learners that are following him, and he's drawing them out. And he's saying to those that would become a mathetes, 
there is a cost associated with following me and being my disciple. It requires more than just action. It requires more than sentiment. It requires more than intention. It requires more than just showing up on a Sunday morning and checking a box. There's more to being a disciple. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you want to be a disciple, it's different than just being in the crowd. It's actually more intense than that. And it's going to cost you something. And it requires action. And Jesus starts to list out his requirements. And he starts in verse 26. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate. Let me just stop there. I mean... This is bewildering. It's confusing. Jesus is using this word that's actually very strong. And then he goes on to say, like, if you're asking, hate who? Hate your mother and your father and your sister and your brother and your wife and your children. Now, this was awkward to preach this message with my mother in the second service. Um, I should have warned her ahead of time. These words are confusing. Hate, specifically, it's like, why is Jesus talking this way? What, is, what does he mean exactly? Well, if you think about the words love and hate, we don't use those terms literally all the time. They're relationship words. Actually, most of the time that they're used, they're used in a non-literal sense. For example, I love the Houston Rockets. I literally love Jose Altuve. I love my wife, Ashley. Now, my marriage is in deep trouble if that word means the same thing, right? All across the board? No. That's not what I would use that word for. It's, it's used in a non-literal sense. I actually enjoy watching the Houston Rockets, but I've committed my life and my love and my affection, and I've said marriage vows to my wife, Ashley. It's very different than loving the Houston Rockets. It's used in a non-literal way. The same is true for the word hate. So I, I hate beets. Every time I see a beet, it looks juicy. Anybody with me here? It looks sweet. It looks enjoyable. And I know some of you actually like beets, and maybe some of you have no idea, idea what I'm talking about. But every time I see a beet, I kind of fall for it. It gets me. I, I guess I'm a visual person, and I bite into it, and instantly I regret the, the beet because I hate beets. It tastes like dirt. I also hate people that cut me off in traffic, and I hate people that don't let me into their lane after my blinker's been on for 60 seconds. It's not a literal hate. So this was also true in Jesus' time. The word hate, the Greek word is missio, missio. And there are two definitions for the word missio. One is active hostility. The other is to love less. Now, Active hostility, people that are listening and we look at this word and we think, well, this is literal. He means Jesus is expecting me to go have a meeting with my parents and my family and like get everybody together and say, guys, I could never love you as much as I love Jesus and walk out awkwardly and never talk to them ever again. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's using it in a comparative sense. He's going after our affections and our devotions. He's saying that we have to love him more. There's a love that's much, much, much greater than anything that I could have for my family. And he's also saying that if we want to be a disciple, that our love for Jesus must be the greatest. It must be ultimate. It must be superior. It must be more than anything. Does this sound familiar? Jesus also said this when he said, when the, the lawyer was talking to him and he asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And the lawyer replied, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And Jesus said, yeah, that's it. That's it. He also said to love your neighbor as yourself. So what is he saying here? He's saying that we've got to love Jesus more than anything else. He's confronting our affections. He's confronting our idols. Idols, is not, idols are not term, another term that we use very much. Tim Keller talks about idols in his book, Counterfeit Gods, and this is his definition of an idol. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. 
An idol is a good thing that's been elevated to the ultimate thing. And the first thing that Jesus goes after, the first idol, is family. Because in Jesus' day, everything revolved around family. If my dad's a carpenter, I'm going to be a carpenter. If my dad's a fisherman, I'm going to be a fisherman. I'm not going to be a lawyer if my dad's a carpenter or a fisherman if he's a builder. You know, I, I'm going to follow in the family line. I'm not going to go live in another town because everything revolves around the family. There's a large house. My cousins live there. My aunt and uncles My grandfather lives there, and if I get married, I'm not going to go live in another town. I'm just going to add on to this house. That's the day and age and the culture that Jesus is living in. And so he's speaking to that, and it's scandalous. It's offensive. In our day and age, we deal with the same problem, although we don't live in a big house with all of our family necessarily. For us, though, it might be that we idolize our children, And everything is about our kids and about their extracurricular activities and giving them the better life, a better life than than we had. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when we begin to worship our children more than Jesus or worship our marriage more than Jesus or worship the idea of marriage, if you're single, wondering and hoping for one day that you'll find the, the spouse that will fulfill all of your desires, everything that you need, You'll be whole and complete if you could just find that person. And if you've been married longer than a day, you know that that's not true. (laughs) That won't happen. Um, So Jesus is confronting this idol, and he's saying that in comparison to our love for Jesus, we must hate the people that we love, which sounds bizarre. But he's saying we have to love him with everything. There are no scales You know, you've seen this pie chart with like God has this much and family has this much and all this other stuff. Actually, God's like, no, I own the pie chart. Jesus is saying, it's all mine, all your heart, all of your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Okay, so that's what he's saying. Second idol he goes after is in verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, jump to the bottom, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Can you think of a culture that exists uh, that exists that uh, exalts individuality above everything else? Where people are searching for whatever can make them look better or feel better at all costs, floating from relationship to relationship, from job to job, from marriage to marriage, from church to church, looking for their own individualized, personalized, tailor-fit experience. Can you think of a culture like that? Our culture is that one. And so what happens is, is when that doesn't fulfill, we're just on to the next thing, the next job, some to the next marriage, some to the next church. And Jesus is saying, it's not about you. It's about, it's about me. And if you're not willing to renounce these things and lay down these things and hate yourself and love me more than yourself, you're not willing to be my disciple. You can't be. Verse 27, he doubles down and he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And at this point, if anyone's still listening to Jesus, their they're, they're jaws on the ground and they're lifting it because they're thinking, this guy's insane. Because they knew visually, if they saw a man walking with a cross, they would know that that's the last thing that man's ever going to do. He has no more life, no more future, no more hopes, no more dreams. He's a dead man walking. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be his disciples, you don't have to pick up Jesus' cross. You have to pick up your own cross and follow him. This was confusing. It would be like saying, if you want to be my disciple, you have to pick up your electric chair and follow me. It's confusing. It's instantly these guys would have known what Jesus was talking about. And then Jesus tells these two parables. Verse 28, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 
to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. We've got these two parables, two stories, where we are builders building a tower. And Jesus is saying, okay, we're building, but before you build, before you jump into this discipleship thing, I've started to lay out the terms. Before you follow me like this and become a mathetese, become a true disciple, you've got to sit down and count the cost. Do you have enough cash? Do you have enough capital to finish the job? Are you going to be able to finish it when the going gets tough, when it becomes very difficult? Are you still going to follow me? And then he tells the story of the warrior that's in battle. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. Do we have enough to fight? Well, on our own, we don't. With Christ, with him, we've got everything. And so Jesus says to count the cost, count the cost. If you want to be my disciple, you better sit down and really contemplate these things. It's going to be hard. You may lose everything that you have. Now, this flies in the face of American Christianity to a degree, right? That's not what we talk about for the most part. I know Jeff does. So you're with me. But a lot of the church of America doesn't talk. We, we ignore this passage and kind of say, yeah, that's kind of weird. And move on to the, the fun stuff. But this is what Jesus has called us to. This is the definition of true discipleship. And I'm asking that we would wrestle with that. And not that we fully understand it. Not that I fully understand it. But that we would go to Jesus and say, Lord, I don't understand what you're saying here. But I, I want to know. I want to engage in this uncomfortable space. Because I think you want us to be uncomfortable. I think you want us to stop and evaluate. Where are loyalties lie and what the idols are in our life. He goes on and says in verse 33, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Your translation may say give up. It means to leave or abandon. The idea of renounce is this idea of this thing that I love. It has no claim on me. I have no claim on it. I hold it open-handed. This job that I have, that I love, it has no claim on me. I have no claim on it. I hold it open-handed. This car that I love or I hate, it has no claim on me. I have no claim on it. It's yours. I hold it open-handed. That's what renounce is saying. And Jesus is saying, if we don't leave or abandon or renounce our job, our house, our car, investments, dreams, desires, goals, if we don't hold them all loosely and say, God, whether they come in or go out, they're all for you. You've given them to me. You're the giver. And if it can be used for your glory and for your kingdom, that's what I want it to be used for. It has no hold on me. I have no claim on it. I hold it open-handed. And if we don't do that, we can't be his disciples. So, I've preached this text a few times, and as I was studying this last week, I had an aha kind of surprise slap in the face of my own that I didn't anticipate. And that is that about 18 months ago, we started this process of we feel called to plant a church. And I had a really great job here in the Houston area with a great future planned. And I drove a really great car, company vehicle. And I got to travel a lot, go check out restaurants all over the nation. And we bought Ashley a really cool car. The confession sidebar on that, what's funny about the Lord is I remember driving off the lot with that car. And I looked over at Ashley and I said, well, this will keep us from ever going back into ministry. Yeah, so that's really great. Uh, so we, 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 had, we, we did sell that vehicle. But my, my, conf my confession is I have started to kind of assess here as I was looking at this text. And, you know, it's easy to see Jesus is calling out our, our love for family, right? That Jesus is more than that. Our love for him must be more. Our love for ourselves, our love, our love for our things. And out of nowhere, I just kind of got smacked by him this week, because I started to say, you know what, I've, I've done this. I, I've done this. I've renounced everything. I've left family. I've looked at this like a checklist, right? I've left my family. I've left my friends. I left my dream, you know, job. I left a good, secure future. I left the cul-de-sac that I was on, 
And I started to think as if this was like some sort of, I've earned my discipleship badge. And that's gross and sickening to me. Almost as if, you know, I'm like, hey, I've left everything. How about you? Like, like I have some upper hand to look down on anyone. And the text just, sh- just shined on me like a big light this week and into my soul. And I had to confess, Lord, I've, I've started to become so achievement-oriented, success-focused. I've looked at this like a list. It's like a challenge. All right, I'm going to check all these things off. I've done it all for you. I've given, every, given everything up to follow you. And I feel like Jesus is saying, some people exalt family. Some people exalt themselves. Some people exalt their things. And some people exalt their religious performance. And they somehow get prideful in their humility. And that's what's happened to me. And that's the true danger of this text is it can look like just a list of things to accomplish, but none of these things, just checking them off, can save you. Jesus alone can satisfy. The true mark of a disciple is one of, of surrender, one whose identity is found firmly in the one who loved me and gave himself for me, like Paul said in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My identity is not in my stuff. It's not in my family. It's not in myself. It's not in my achievements. It's not in my religious performance, whatever that is. And so for you, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know which one of those things is hitting you. Now, I also want to say, you know, you look at a text like this and you think, okay, well, like Ben, are you, are you saying that I have to quit my job and sell my stuff and go like plant a church somewhere in some random town? I don't know if I also told you, I'm not an Aggie. I didn't go to Texas a and It's like super weird. So everybody loves me there and it's great. I am looking for an Aggie ring in pawn shops just so I can fit in. Um, if anyone's watching this live stream from... College Station, I'm sorry. I love you. I love you guys. I mean, I hate you. Uh, (laughs) Jesus is saying that our affection has to be set on him. And these things that we have, they're just things. Our family, it's a blessing to have a great godly wife and children that serve the Lord. It's a blessing to have a great home. It's a blessing to uh, do some things for him. But the danger of becoming that culture that just gets kind of obsessed with our achievements for Jesus is that that's not the point. We need to be kind of obsessed and excited just about Jesus, not about our accomplishments for him. So with all of this, I would say that we need to just go to the Lord and surrender and say, Jesus, what area of this text are you speaking to me? I can't answer those questions about church planning or being a missionary or you know, downsizing. I don't know what God might be calling you to do. Only he knows. That's between you and him. And so as we prepare to respond to the Lord this morning, I just want you to just close your eyes and, and bow your heads and just, just in quiet, ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. Say, Jesus, is there some area of my life that you want me to renounce? Is there something that I have elevated that's a good thing? to the place of ultimate thing that that you need to knock down. Let's just listen for a moment. Holy Spirit, I know that you're here and I know that you're speaking all over this room. And we want to respond to you, Jesus. We want to respond to your words. And we can't do that without your help. We can't do anything without you. We can't even surrender without your drawing us. And so I pray that you would draw us this morning and that you would help us to renounce the things in our life that we've elevated too highly. 
I pray that you help us to understand the demands and the severity of the gospel in light of the rewards of the gospel. I pray that maybe for the first time, someone here that's just been in the crowd would say, you know what, I wanna be a disciple. I'm willing to leave it all behind because I've tried to fill that void in my heart with things, with people, with achievements, with accolades, and you're just empty. And Jesus is saying, I'm drawing you, I'm calling you, I'm here, I'm waiting. If that's you today, and you've never decided to, to follow him, just take a moment right now and just breathe a prayer. Jesus, I'm ready to follow you, whatever that looks like. For those of you that already are following Jesus, maybe he's calling you to go into a deeper devotion with him. So as he draws you, I pray that you would. Holy Spirit, help us not to dull the edges off of your words, but to take them seriously today. I pray that you would draw your people, your disciples, draw us to abandonment, to surrender for the reward that's in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.